Okay, Tyler, I just wanted to ask first off, how did you learn about this job and how did it all come about for you? Certainly. Well, as the cliche goes, your network is your net worth. And so I had a colleague from my time in the California League when I worked for the Advanced Day affiliate of Padres on the Council of Storm. That was 2014 through 2016 season, so three seasons there. And uh, a fellow who actually worked for the Lancaster Jetbox, certainly a team I enjoyed going to visit, and unfortunately no one gets to go visit anymore because of the contraction, but uh, one of the broadcasters there obviously had a relationship with Andy Dunn, our team president here in Vancouver, and he put my name forward when Andy requested some, some names of individuals that this fellow named Marshall Kellner uh, thought might be a good fit for this position. Andy wanted to do the best he could to fill the role without having to go through a nationwide search and you know, jump through all the hoops and, and listen to all the tapes and read all the resumes of the countless good radio broadcast hopefuls that would submit themselves to any radio position. And so I uh, really just got a call from Andy one day, I believe it was a, a Wednesday or a Thursday, and then went, I was in Seattle at the time, and then drove down to Hillsboro to meet with him and uh, Tom Backemeyer, our executive vice president, and we had a, a lunch meeting, and they offered me the job that day. So my first day was on April 12th. So they offered me just about a week prior to that. So it's been a relatively quick turnaround, but I just feel really lucky to have landed, not just with a great team in general, but with a great team that's also in the Blue Jays organization, one that I know so well and have really fond feelings for, even as a San Diego Padres fan. Of course, growing up in San Diego, you're going to be a Padres fan more times than not. And I have been since I was, even before I was born, in fact, my parents were going to game to Jack Murphy Stadium in Mission Valley there in San Diego. But... Really, right place, right time. Andy likes my stuff, likes the fact that I've been in the Blue Jays organization before. And the three of us, myself, Andy, and Tom, struck up an immediate rapport. And although there's only been a couple of weeks, the rest is history, as they say. Well, and you talked about the contraction that has affected a lot of uh, minor league franchises and led to some restructuring, of course, now with the High A West League, which we're all now in. I'm sure maybe one of the disappointing aspects was maybe seeing the Padres leave as an affiliate of the Tri-City Dust Devils, um, you know, so you might have had a chance to at least kind of keep the tabs on your favorite team's prospects as well. So I guess the good news, bad news was, I guess, maybe a bit of that. I mean, you know, you yeah. didn't mention Lake Elsinore as well. Certainly. And, you know, I would have loved to see a Padres affiliate anywhere in the high A West just for the opportunity to keep my tabs on what's happening in the farm system of, on the fan side, my favorite franchise. Of course, on the professional side, the Blue Jays are my favorite franchise. I've watched more seasons with them than any other big league affiliate, as you know. But that being said, the uh, high A affiliate in Fort Wayne for the Padres really is a terrific stop when they were low A in the Midwest League. Players who would come to Lake Elsinore when I was there, was there, they would rave about Parkview Field and say all of these great things about the city and the fan base and all the sellouts and what the atmosphere was like there. And so, as a Padres fan, it's kind of a win-loss scenario for me. Yes, you lose the affiliate up here in the Northwest, but at the same time, a great affiliate in Fort Wayne has an opportunity to bump up the level to advance day and have an opportunity to showcase even better talent for their fans. But, you know, you talk about the contraction dial and I think as much as we hate to see teams get contracted, like the Jetthawks, of course, it certainly is a, a shame that they're not able to continue their history, continue to rock the hawk down there at the hangar. But that being said, the benefit is that the Vancouver Canadians are now a high-A team and an opportunity for C's fans, not just this year. Obviously, they'll be home away from home. We will be home away from home here in Hillsboro, so fans will have to tune in on our radio broadcast and pay attention on social media. But in the future... Advanced Day Baseball is coming in at Bailey Stadium, so as much as it's been so great for these fans to get to experience the joy of players having a first opportunity to be a professional baseball player coming out of high school, college, or international signees who really are getting their first taste of professional ball in rookie level, well, now you're going to get older players, a more refined game, and an opportunity to see some better baseball, and I think these fans, both passionate baseball fans as well as casual baseball fans, certainly are in for a treat with better baseball coming to them soon. And I know you've been asked this question a million and one times, and I'm going to make it a million and two. 
stepping into really a, a legend's shoes and Rob Fay, who's called over a thousand games. Uh, how do you feel about, you know, stepping into somebody's shoes like that with Rob Fay, who's, you know, pretty well known uh, in these parts? Absolutely. You know, it's not lost on me, the legacy that Rob leaves behind, the great work that he did in the number of seasons. What was it, 15 seasons as the voice of the seas? Uh, it's a long time. And the fan base certainly came to know and love Rob for everything he did. And I tip my cap to all the great work he did over the years. I have a lot of respect for him. I've heard a number of his broadcasts, many of his highlight calls, and had interacted with him as a part of the Blue Jays system over the past three seasons when we would do the Blue Jays organizational roundup called Around the Nest, where every level from rookie ball to AAA, the broadcasters would call in, and we basically do a roundtable sports talk show where we do our updates from our level, make some predictions, talk about the things that we're excited for, and had a chance to interact with Rob a number of times on that show. So certainly have to honor the legacy that comes before me, while at the same time calling my game and bringing my passion and excitement and energy and appreciation for the game of baseball and for the Blue Jays organization to my broadcast night in and night out. So certainly a uh, typical of the cap to Rob, huge shoes to fill. But I'm really excited for the opportunity and a chance to put my own spin on these broadcasts. Okay, so you mentioned you started out your pro baseball career announcing uh, with Lake Elsinore, but uh, how did you get into play-by-play announcing? When did the bug kind of take hold for you? Certainly. So I got recruited to play college baseball at a small Division three liberal arts school in Los Angeles called Whittier College. And Whittier's claim to fame, of course, is that that's the uh, undergraduate Richard Nixon, he grew up in the Whittier area, went to undergrad at Whittier College, and so while I was at Whittier, I played baseball for one season, and if you've seen the Sandlot, I was the small of the Whittier College baseball team, number 36 out of 36 guys, so I didn't see the field a lot, uh, really was more like the locker room and dugout mascot, and from there, the next two years, I uh, tried to make it sophomore year, I got cut from the team, and then tried to reinvent myself as a pitcher my junior season, and that didn't work out either. But throughout that time, I was doing other things. I hosted a radio show that was all music and nothing sports related. I wrote for the newspaper, which was in the sports field in terms of writing for the soccer team, a little bit of football, some basketball, but really not a lot of baseball. I was part of a fraternity and had that entire college experience. But come my senior year, this is the fall of 2011, going into the spring of 2012 when I graduated, the college really was starting to expand broadcasting the sports on the internet to parents and fans and family members of their student athletes. And for the moment at that time, it was just an old MacBook, a Firewire cable, and a home video recorder that was on a tripod that they would put basically wherever it was not in the way. So by no means was it any kind of professional broadcast setup. And I found out through a little bit of the work I'd been doing with the campus TV station. And again, it's a small liberal arts school, so it's not like Syracuse or anything like that where they've got these big multimedia productions, separate journalism or communication schools. Really, it is just a small student-run setup. And I found out that the athletic department was looking for people to call some basketball games. So as much as I didn't really know much about basketball and didn't grow up a basketball fan, of course, there was no San Diego basketball team in the NBA when I was growing up. Of course, the Clippers left many, many months prior to my birth in 1990. Right. But I just said, you know what, let's figure it out. So I hopped on a broadcast, and we just kind of improvised throughout the basketball season. And then they were going to start broadcasting baseball. And it was a similar setup, just the very, very basic broadcast equipment, one very minor headset. When I say minor, I mean it was held together with tape. <laughs> and I sat in the stands at the Whittier College baseball field, which was just metal bleachers, not even anything special, and with parents and other students and fans sitting around me, I just started calling games, and doing so pretty much teaching myself along the way. can't say I've really had any hard and fast broadcasting tutelage or scholarship of any sort, but really it was a learn-by-doing situation, getting those reps, having a chance to get a feel for the game, a feel for timing, a feel for understanding when to talk, when to not, speed, pace, all of those things learned in the stands at Whittier College my senior year. And so from there, with the foundation laid, the college said to me, Tyler, we'd love to have you come back after you graduate here in spring 2012, come back in the fall of 2012, and we'd love for you to helm our fledgling Whittier College Sports Network, WCSN, 
alongside the sports information director working in the athletic administration side of the department. And from there, went home to San Diego for the summer, enjoyed my first summer as a post-grad, and then went back up to Whittier in Los Angeles. And for the next 18 months, was calling games of all sorts, baseball, soccer, football, basketball, water polo, which the first water polo game I ever watched, I was podcasting. So a whole lot of learning by doing and an opportunity to get my feet wet and be thrown directly into the fire without too much at stake. So being able to make some mistakes and being able to have some growing pains in that very small ecosystem really bode, bode well for me because I was able to have that confidence and, and get those repetitions without a whole lot of skin in the game if you catch my drift. So after 18 months working there, I got a text from a former friend of mine at Whittier who had gotten an internship with the Storm in their ticket department the year prior. He said, hey, we've got a media relations intern spot that just opened up. The person who was supposed to do it, they bailed. They left. They did not say why they were leaving, but they were there one day and they packed up their stuff and left that night. And so I got out to Lake Elsinore really quickly. Began, began, excuse me, became a media relations intern in 2014, and that had no broadcasting attached to it, but I was lucky enough to work for a team that had an incredible human being as their broadcaster. His name is Sean McCall. He, has, by now, has worked for the team for 24 seasons and was the broadcaster in the Cal League who was the most experienced and the most veteran, and he knew I had an interest in broadcasting, so he took me under his wing and started to give me a, a little bit of few looks on the radio that first year, but then in 2015, after I'd been hired on full-time as the assistant director of marketing, I started to do, my last name, is, as you know, is Zickel, and one of my nicknames is Zick, and I started to do Zick in the Six, is what Sean would call it. So I would get the sixth inning of select road game, uh, because it was mostly a commuter league in the Cal League, bus rides there and back every day. And that's really how it all began. And so I would eventually fill in for Sean when he had to leave town a few times, got a few full games under my belt. And then after three seasons there, doing a lot of things away from the broadcast booth as well, I was looking to expand my broadcasting responsibilities. The Storm wanted me to go more heavily into the marketing and digital media side, which would have taken away from my opportunity to be on the radio with Sean. So I said, I need to go find something that allows me to be a radio broadcaster. So I got a position with the New Hampshire Fisher Cats for the 2017 season that at the time was just seasonal. But I was able to parlay that into a full-time role and was there for three seasons plus half of 2020 until I was furloughed as part of the pandemic. And, of course, everybody tightening their belt across all different industries, live sports included, and went on a little bit of a vision quest back to the West Coast before connecting with the Canadians this year. Okay. I just also want to ask about, you know, you, you talked about how you got into play-by-play. Is there maybe anyone you kind of look up to or anyone you like to follow as far as play-by-play announcers go, whether it's baseball or any sport? Yeah, certainly. For me, my all-time favorite broadcaster is Matt Maskersian. For me, my formative years listening to Padres games were when he was on the call. And I think I certainly, when I listen to myself and sometimes even in my own headset during games, can hear just a little bit of similarity into some of my tone and pacing and, of course, my excitement as well, Matt Maskers, what I like about him is he, he feels the emotion in the game. His call, Santa Maria, certainly has punctuated a lot of great moments from my teenage years watching Padres baseball. And by no means do I try to imitate or even feel anything that he does because it's, in my opinion, important to be able to develop your own voice, your own style. But that being said, we are the sum of all of our experiences, and I've listened to a lot of Matt Maskersian over the years. So he's number one for me. I mentioned Sean McCall. He, although never broadcast higher than advanced day, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, those who meet him and listen, he could very well be a big league broadcaster tomorrow. And he is the biggest professional influence on my life and is still one of my greatest friends. And beyond that, I can't say anything bad about Kevin Harlan on a national level. I really love the way he calls the game. And I know that this might be a controversial statement to make, but I also like the way Joe Buck goes about calling baseball on television. I know Joe Buck is a love him or hate him type of guy. I had a chance to listen to a podcast that he hosts to get to know him more as a person as well. Not that we I know him personally, but getting to know him more than just a voice on television on those primetime games. But I do appreciate the way he goes about his business. And he has been a true pro since he was 21 years old. So you got to respect that. 
Well, you're not going to get an argument from me on that. I, I, I'm a big Joe Buck fan myself. I think he calls a great game, so no question about that. I agree. Um, so being a Padres fan, um, something I wanted to ask about has been, I guess, uh, a lot of the uniform changes <laughs> that that team has gone through. Uh, I personally like the brown and gold uh, that they're uh, rocking right now. I guess what was your favorite uniform of the Padres and some of the Padres players uh, you like to follow? Absolutely. So for me, I mean, the number one player of all time is Tony Gwynn. For me, he is my favorite player forever and always. And that goes right into that 1998 World Series run that the Padres made. That really is about the earliest baseball memories that I have that aren't informed by photos or home videos or stories that my parents or grandparents have told me about our times at Padres games. So that 1998 season really was when my individual baseball fandom was entrenched. And that goes with those orange and blue uniforms that they wore so proudly. They had the home white pinstripes with the Padres across the chest. In fact, I just found at a vintage uh, clothing store here in Portland uh, a Padres jersey from that era, an authentic Russell Brand Padres pinstripe jersey, which is now one of my prized possessions, but a very close second, maybe 1A being those blue and orange, and 1B being the current iteration of the brown and gold. I really think they hit it out of the park, no pun intended, with that color scheme and the way the uniforms were created. They brought the pinstripes back. They even have those tacky pinstripes and being the Padres playing in a city like San Diego, for many, many years, myself and so many Padres fans have felt that the team really needed to embrace a unique identity. And it wasn't that wasn't happening with the blue and white motif in various iterations over the, let's call it 2002 to the 2019 season. There was really no standout, hey, you turn the TV on or you're at a sports bar or anywhere and you quickly glance at the television and you see the score bug is brown. That's the Padres previously, you wouldn't really be able to tell. So I love what the Padres are doing to be able to stand out and really make some noise on the field and in the team store with that great merchandise. Okay, so going on from the Padres and now moving to the Canadians here, I know there's got to be a lot of preparations. I'm sure you're kind of getting ready for opening day on May the 4th in Spokane and then the home away from home opener, as I believe you called it, uh, May 11th. I guess, what are the preparations uh, that you're undertaking right now, getting ready for the season? Certainly. Well, here in Hillsboro at Ron Tonkin Field, which is very much our home away from home, and we're doing everything we can to make it such, a whole lot of stuff is happening. The equipment truck arrived yesterday. We offloaded a bunch of things. In fact, today I've spent down in the tunnel basically breaking down those pallets of equipment. We're loading it into the various clubhouses and getting things ready for the player arrival next week. And when it comes to my job specifically as it relates to broadcasting and media relations, still waiting on uh, an opportunity to speak to our manager, Donnie Murphy, who I know from my days in New Hampshire. He was our hitting coach out there back in 2019. So him and I have exchanged some texts. We're both excited to see each other when he gets here next week. But uh, when, uh, when Murph and I speak later this week, we're going to be able to talk about the potential roster. He's got a really good idea of which guys are coming here, but obviously that's not finalized until the Blue Jays are ready to make it official. So still waiting to really start in earnest my player preparation, but there are some names that I recognize along the way, and certainly Seeds fans are going to recognize a lot of names of guys who are going to be wearing the Vancouver red and white for a second time at another level. Certainly a unique experience for a lot of those players who have been Canadians in the past as a rookie team, and now we'll get to be Canadians of the present in high A. So that preparation is about to start, but we've got a four-man crew here between Andy, Tom, Stephanie Ellis, who is our assistant general manager, and myself, and then there's the whole team back in Vancouver working everything on the back end. Everybody that you know and love there in that Bailey Stadium who is still employed by the team. They're at the ballpark making sure everything goes smoothly as well. So it's been certainly an interesting experience for me so far working on week two of my Canadians' employment. But it really is a international effort between Vancouver and Hillsboro. We're making it happen, and we're going to turn Ron Tonkin Field into Nat Bailey Stadium South. That's the goal this year. Okay, and final question, Tyler, and thanks again for your time. I just uh, also wanted to find out what's been the reaction around the Portland area about basically having two affiliated minor professional teams in the area now? Certainly. It's been nothing but 
a positive, and I certainly can't finish this answer without expressing my gratitude and the Canadians' gratitude for the Hops organization. Everybody in their front office, from their president, KL, all the way down to every single employee, has been so welcoming, so helpful, answering all of our questions, making sure that we feel as at home as possible as we can't be at Nat Bailey. So certainly a tip of the cap and a big thanks to the Hillsborough Hops entire organization. And then in the community as a whole, we're still working on that effort of really letting people know, hey, you're getting double the baseball this summer at Ron Tonkin Field. In fact, there will not be a day all season that baseball is not played here at this ballpark at this wonderful multi-sport facility here. So it's a great opportunity for fans in Hillsboro, Beaverton, Portland, and all the surrounding communities to really celebrate the return of minor league baseball. What better way to do that than with double the fun? And certainly with the Hops doing their thing, they're well known for the fun they put on, and us bringing the Seas show down south. It's going to be a great summer for this area. It's certainly disappointing we can't be at Nat Bailey this summer, but since that situation is outside of our control, we're making the best of it, and we've been very well received by this community and this region. Tyler, thanks a million for this. Really appreciate it. And uh, welcome to Vancouver or Hillsboro for now, but hopefully we can welcome you to Vancouver uh, sooner rather than later. Absolutely. I have heard nothing but great things about the city and, of course, about the fan base and the community. And it's at the top of my bucket list now to be able to get up to Vancouver and experience all the city has to offer. But for now, we're going to make the best of it here in Hillsboro. And the most important thing for me, Nile, baseball is back on May 4th. These are taking the field for the first time in 20 months. Feels longer sometimes, but so glad to see that red and white on the field. May 4th, we're going to be in Pasco, Washington, taking on those Duck Devils, ironically enough. So it'll be a great chance to, to get the season started. And you said it right, home away from home opener on May 11th, of course. Information for that, tickets as well on sale at CanadiansBaseball.com. And if anybody's in this area who tunes in or has a chance to check out your website, that's a chance for them to see some Canadians baseball in person. But until we have a chance to get back to Vancouver, I'm looking forward to connecting with these fans on the radio and painting a great picture every night, having everybody come along with us.